Brandon, Jenny for their leadership and faith. Um, you know, I was watching you all play, and just even watching you play is an act of worship, just seeing your gifts to the Lord, and we're very blessed to have you here today. Um, we are in the seventh week now in a series on Joseph, the Old Testament figure whom God uh, brought to Egypt for a great purpose. And we've been watching Joseph's life and what God is doing uh, through Joseph. And the question is always not focusing on Joseph himself, but focusing on God. What's happening here? Now, the passage I read before, chapter uh, 42, uh, is after Joseph has, of course, been sold into slavery, he's been uh, railroaded, thrown in prison, uh, after, and he's in prison many years, and he, he is promoted by Pharaoh through a series of, uh, of uh, things that the world would call coincidence, but we know is providence, God really at work. And he ends up as prime minister of Egypt in charge of the famine relief efforts that saves the nation. Well, this famine extends beyond Egypt to the land of Canaan also, and chapter 42 picks up where going back to Canaan and Jacob and his other sons. And Jacob says, we're, we're starving to death here, guys. Now, remember, by this time, his sons are grown men. Joseph himself, by the time we read this verse, Joseph is in his late 30s, and his brothers were uh, well beyond that. They, some of them could have been approaching 60 even. So he says to his uh, other sons, guys, you've got to go buy grain for us. We're starving to death. But if you notice something, part of the whole problem with Joseph and his family, there's some really bad family dynamics. Joseph was the favored because he was the son of J uh, Jacob's favored wife. And then Benjamin was the other son of that same wife, Rachel. But when Jacob sends his, ten so his sons down to Egypt, he does not send Benjamin. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Benjamin is the only one remaining from his beloved Rachel, and he wants to keep Benjamin, who's probably in his early 30s at least. He's not a child. He wants to keep Benjamin close by him, but also he doesn't trust his other sons. If you read in there, it says he feared that harm might come to Benjamin. Jacob, although it's never explicitly stated, I believe by this time Jacob comes to realize that his other sons had something to do with Joseph's supposed death. Now, that's where we read in chapter 42. Chapters 42, 43, 44, and 45 are really one story. But we can't read four chapters of Scripture to you today, so I just want to summarize them really quickly. The brothers go down to Egypt. Joseph recognizes them, but he doesn't recognize, they don't recognize him. He's older. He's, he's dress, dressed in a, Egyptian regalia um, with Egyptian makeup, and Joseph remembers the dreams that his brothers would bow down to him, which is exactly what happens. And he starts playing this cat and mouse game with them where, where he treats them harshly and then he treats them kindly. And, and he throws them in prison, but then he lets them out and he says, you guys, if you're telling me the truth, you go back and bring this supposed younger brother back to me and I'm going to keep one of your other brothers here in prison, which is what he does. Now, Joseph has reason for doing this. He wants to see Benjamin, but he is also subtly afraid that maybe his brothers has harmed Benjamin as well. Well, the brothers go back to Jacob. They say, we, we meant the Lord of the land, and he was very harsh with us. He said, the only way we can buy more grain is if we bring Benjamin. And Jacob says, I will never send Benjamin down there. But after a while, the food runs out, and Jacob has no choice but to send Benjamin down. They go down again, and at the sight of his youngest brother, Joseph just dissolves into tears. And, and actually, through the scripture, from this point on, Joseph is recorded as crying, weeping profoundly at least seven times. Um, he sees Benjamin, and, uh, and, and he treats the brothers with a great kindness, still keeping his identity a secret. But then he does something that really provokes the crisis of this passage. And this is the climactic scene. As he sends them on their way, and, and many of you probably know the story, he, puts, he hides his silver cup in Benjamin's saddlebag with all the grain. And then when the brothers go off, he sends his steward after them, and he said, you tell them, why did you steal from me? Why have you repaid good with evil and they don't know what he's talking about and they say no one has stolen a thing but if anyone has we'll all become your slaves and the steward checks the saddlebags beginning with the oldest Reuben going down to the youngest Benjamin and when they see that cup they don't know how it got there but their hearts they tear their clothes in grief and they return to Egypt and this is what Joseph says and this is right before the next passage we're going to read he said why did you do that now the one who stole the cup supposedly Benjamin, will have to stay here as my slave. Now see what Joseph's doing. He's setting them up to kind of relive the situation that they had with him before. 
And it's that point, and this is very important understanding the rest of the passage which we're going to read, at that point, Judah, the fourth oldest brother, who has assumed leadership of the family, he steps forward and he says, don't keep the boy. Again, he's not really a boy, he's about 30. Don't keep the boy. I'll stay in his place. I will be the slave. Let him go free. And it's at that point when Judah offers himself for his brother that Joseph finally reveals himself and reconciliation can take place. So we're going to continue in our reading uh, right after that scene where Judah offers himself in the place of Benjamin, and it's going to be in chapter 45, verses 1 through 11. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. It says, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years they will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. And let me pause there just for a second. That statement there is one that we can chew on for the rest of our lives, that God never authored this evil that happened to Joseph. He did not cause the brothers to do that. But somehow, in the mystery of human free will and divine sovereignty, God works all things out to accomplish his purposes, showing how great God is. So Joseph is seeing behind this tragic event. of it. And remember, he's been, you know, he's been away from home now for 20 years. He sees God at work. So he says, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your holy word, your healing word, the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now, Lord, that the words of my mouth and meditations of all our hearts would be pure and acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You know, the first time the, um, the invitation came, it was 1991. But it really wasn't a good time for me back then. See, I had recently graduated seminary and hadn't yet started my first call. Faith and I... We're getting ready to move, and money was tight. Besides, almost 200 bucks for a couple of tickets seemed a little pricey to me, so I decided, with everything going on, not to go. Well, the next time the invitation came was 10 years later, in 2001. But that wasn't a good time either. We were serving a church up in Ohio, and I could afford it this time, I guess. But the kids were young, really young, and, and the thought of packing everybody up in the family truckster and Hauling everybody to New York didn't sound so appealing, so I skipped that one too. The latest invitation came in 2011, but by then, right then, we were settling down to our new lives in Huntington. Faith and I had a lot to do. The kids were getting acquainted with a new school and making new friends, so, so 2011 really didn't work out either. My next chance, well, that'll come in 2021, when my high school class celebrates its 40th reunion. But I don't think I'll go to that one either. 
You see, by that time I figure, what's the point? After 40 years, anybody I'd want to keep up with, I would have already kept up in touch with anyway. Besides, if I'm really being honest, and, and I'm trying to be, I have to admit, the only reason I'd be tempted to go to my high school reunion is to brag. I mean, really, come on. Isn't that one of the reasons everybody goes to their reunions? We're curious to see how everybody's done and, and how we measure up. Who's made it? And who has? And who, who's still got a full head of hair? And whose waistlines have doubled? I know my motivation would be to quietly compare myself against people I haven't seen in four decades, thinking that, well, you may have been the class president, but I, I married the homecoming queen. Hey, good for me. I really didn't. I never let my kids forget that. Or, or you may have been voted most likely to succeed, but I am a job I truly love. So I probably won't be going to my next reunion either, if for no other reason than I'd be going with the wrong motivation. We know Joseph actually had plenty of motivations for his own kind of reunion. I mean, if, if you think about it, in these passages we read today, Joseph has every reason in the world to go back home and dazzle everybody with all his success. Of course, uh, Joseph hadn't exactly been an overnight success, but that's what makes his story so compelling. It's been a long, hard road, starting with his brother's betrayal, selling him into slavery in Egypt. And then after, after Joseph finally gets his feet underneath him, he, he finds himself quickly moving up the corporate ladder, working for an important Egyptian official named Potiphar. That is, until Potiphar's sexually frustrated wife couldn't seduce Joseph into an affair and ended up accusing him of rape instead, which landed Joseph in prison for a long, really long time. But it was there in prison that Joseph meets two of Pharaoh's officials whose dreams he interprets, and then years later, when Pharaoh is troubled by his own dreams, one of them finally remembers Joseph and he recommends him to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is so impressed with Joseph that he promotes him to prime minister of the entire nation on the spot. And he gives Joseph the special responsibility of preparing the nation for the devastating famine these dreams foretold. Now, you know, to say Joseph was, uh, was a success in all this, in his new station in life, uh, you know, that would be like saying Michael Jordan was a pretty good basketball player. Joseph just wasn't pretty good at what he did. There was nobody else like him. God had blessed Joseph so that his famine relief plan saved Egypt from certain disaster and it made him an indispensable member of Pharaoh's court. In fact, after Pharaoh, there was nobody, and think about this, nobody in the entire world more powerful than Joseph, which is pretty good for a kid from the sticks. But for some reason, this kid from the sticks never goes home. Which is kind of curious. You know, there's no triumphal homecoming. There's no long-awaited reunion. In fact, Joseph never chooses to deal with his past at all. Either to settle the score with his brothers for betraying him, or even, you know, at minimum to send word to his father that he was still alive and doing well. I mean, think about it. Joseph could have done anything he wanted, gone anywhere in the world, but the one thing he chooses not to do, the one place he chooses not to go, is home. And the question is, why? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. You know, for Joseph, it was just too painful. I mean, you see, by the time Joseph's brothers show up unexpectedly in Egypt to buy grain, the passage we read today, Joseph has been gone roughly 20 years and prime minister of Egypt for almost eight. And the sight of his brothers bowing down there before him, oblivious to who he really was, you know, it must have awoken such intense feelings in Joseph that it obviously takes him a little while to work through it all. And, you know, that's the point of these cat and mouse games. He plays with them. He throws them in prison. Then he lets them out. He alternates terror with tenderness, threatening them, and then showing unexpected mercy and kindness. And while we might think Joseph's, you know, just being vindictive here, you know, part of it is Joseph simply trying to get his footings, his bearings, you know, working it out in his own heart. You see, even though Joseph may have been content to leave his past in the past, God 
wasn't. And the point of this unexpected reunion is that God was shaking things up. He was pushing Joseph and his brothers for their own good. Oh, what do I mean by that, by pushing? Well, you know, when I first started graduate school, I, I didn't really comprehend the step up that was necessary in the quality of work I'd have to do. Now, I was a, I was a good student in college, but graduate school was a whole different ballgame. And I remember getting a paperback once in which I received a B. But I think the B was more a reflection of my professor's kindness than what I really deserved. Because underneath my grade, you know, the professor wrote his comments. And the last sentence, I will never forget this as long as I live. The last sentence he said, John, this is a good basic paper. And he underlined basic to emphasize his point. But then he added, he said, but it is not up to the quality of your classmates. And let me tell you, man, that stung. That really stung. After getting almost straight A's in college to be told I was bringing up the rear, man, that's something I didn't want to hear. It was something I needed to hear. In fact, I don't think I'd ultimately been able to go on to further schooling if that professor didn't call me out and challenge me to dig deeper. Fact is, I needed a push. That's what he gave me. He gave me a gentle push, which is exactly what God has been doing with Joseph and what Joseph is now doing with his brothers. See, up to this point, if you've been following this series, you know Joseph's life has been a series of ups and downs. He's betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. Then he finds a modern modicum of success in Potiphar's house. Then he's unjustly thrown in prison. Then he's finally remembered and God lifts him up and puts Joseph in a prime minister position to save many lives. It's up and down, up and down. And you know, we might wonder, couldn't God have just skipped all the pain and the heartache and everything and just plunked Joseph down where he wanted him all along? Avoiding all the hardships and, and all the stops and starts along the way? Couldn't God have done that? Of course, the answer is no. No more than Joseph could have just revealed himself to his brothers right at the start and slapped him on the backs and said, hey guys, let's just bygones, let's let bygones be bygones. You see, genuine healing, spiritual growth required much more than that. Joseph and his brothers each had to undergo their own personal experience of transformation. I mean, you've got to remember, this family... Jacob's family. It was an absolute mess. This is the family through whom God said He would bless the world, but they can't even bless each other. You see, their father Jacob's blatant favoritism, it had poisoned the whole family system from top to bottom. It turned Joseph into a self-absorbed, self-centered adolescent who was clearly in danger of growing up into a man who thought the world revolved around him. Someone with no real empathy or regard for others. That's what Joseph is in danger of, and the brothers. By this time, they'd already grown up to be angry and resentful men. They were men capable of real violence. But this is the family through whom God said His covenant promise would come. So clearly, something had to change. And something does. God gives Joseph the push he needed, not all at once, but in fits and starts, through ups and downs. God pushes Joseph until he breaks Joseph's heart, and Joseph's finally in a place where God can use him for a purpose greater than himself. You know, I mean, don't you see, Joseph, he had to go through these things in order to become the kind of man God was calling him to be. And the same method God uses with Joseph, he uses through Joseph to change his brothers too. You see, Joseph, you know, and if you go back and read these chapters, Joseph provokes them in a sense. He pokes at them, he teases them, not out of spite, but in order to gauge their hearts and, and bring them to a point of crisis where a decision has to be made. I mean, one minute he's stern with them, throwing them all in prison keeping them as hostage until they return with their brother Benjamin. The next minute, he's extraordinarily kind, filling their bags with silver and, and grain and weeping behind their backs. But the real test, the thing that triggers it all, is when Joseph sets them up for a new betrayal. See, he restages their original treachery 
where they now have to consider giving up Benjamin to save their own skin. But it's all done for a reason. Commentator Derek Kidner, uh, one of the most insightful comments I've ever heard on this passage, he says this. He says, As first sight, the rough handling which now dominates the scene, you know, the way Joseph is treating his brothers, has the look of vengefulness. Nothing could be more natural, but nothing further from the truth. Behind the harsh prose, Kidner says, there was warm affection. And after the ordeal, overwhelming kindness, even the threats were tempered with mercy, and the shocks that were administered took the form of embarrassment rather than blows. And then he says this, just how well judged was his policy can be seen in the growth of quite new attitudes in the brothers. And you have to picture this imagery as the alternating sun and frost broke them open to God. As the alternating sun and frost broke them open to God. Do you, do you understand what Kidner's saying? This, this cat and mouse game Joseph's playing, it, stern one minute, exceedingly kind the next. It isn't a game. He purposely keeps them off balance until their hearts are broken and until what's inside their hearts are exposed. And when the choice of giving up Benjamin to save themselves is offered, the most amazing thing happens. One of the brothers, Judah, steps up and he offers himself instead. And so right before this climactic scene in chapter 45, which we read, where Joseph finally reveals himself, Judah says this. He says, now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No. Do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Now why is this significant? Well, if you remember, Judah was the chief instigator for selling Joseph into slavery 20 years before. And over these past two decades, Judah has been on a spiritual journey of his own, but the alternating sun and frost, judgment and mercy, has finally broken Judah and broken the rest of Joseph's brothers and has brought them to the place where they cannot simply endure the thought of another betrayal. So instead of betrayal, Judah offers himself. And that's when we see reconciliation can finally take place. When one offers himself in the place of another. A woman named Andrea, she tells how she went through the experience of an, of an awful marriage and, and a painful time that finally ended in divorce. She was the granddaughter of a minister whom she loved very much and who had actually had performed her wedding ceremony. But after the divorce, all through the problems with it, she was, she was ashamed and she was embarrassed and she felt guilty. And, and so Andrea avoided all of her family during the whole thing. But a day finally came she wasn't looking forward to. A day when she couldn't avoid everybody anymore. It was a family reunion and she went that day. She was afraid. She didn't know what to expect, how she'd be received. And she describes what it's like having to see everybody at that reunion, especially her grandfather, the minister, the one who had done her wedding, the one she felt she'd especially let down. She says, I, I remember starting to walk up a long grassy hill to where he stood. When he saw me, immediately he started down the hill toward me. And before I could think of anything adequate to say, he hugged me. He said, you know, I've been thinking, what did I say wrong at the wedding? And then I dissolved into tears in his arms. And after I composed myself, I looked at his wet-eyed face and we didn't say anything. I didn't say anything to him, and he didn't say anything to me, but he slipped his arm around my shoulder, and we walked back up the hill, back into the family. And she says, I realized more fully than I had ever known before the power of loving forgiveness. You know, the fact is, Joseph and his brothers were broken men. And brokenness littered their lives, but somehow... God used that brokenness to ultimately bless them, to heal them, and to turn them into something great. But even more than Joseph and his brother's story, this story reminds us, you know, that we're broken people too. 
As Tim Keller says, we all live in a broken world. We, we've got difficulties to face, and every person on earth has a broken soul. We're foolish. We're, we're blind. We're, we're self-centered, easily led astray. And we need someone to step forward. Someone to reconcile us and lead us and welcome us back into the family too. That's why what Judah does has added significance. See, Judah offers himself in the place of his brother. It's the evidence of, of his heart that's been changed, and, and that's for sure. And it's when reconciliation finally is able to take place, but it's even more than that. See, we have to remember, as I said before early on, this story is not about Joseph. It's not about Judah. It's not about their father, Jacob. The story is always about God and his broader plan of redemption for our lives. You see, in this exchange between Jacob's sons, the son and the frost, Judah offering himself for Benjamin, Joseph reconciling, we see something absolutely divine is taking place. Judah, the one who offers himself for his brother, just happens to be the direct ancestor of Jesus Christ. It's actually not Joseph. We might think it is, but it's not. It's Judah. Joseph has his own role to play in God's redemptive plan. But by offering himself in the place of another Judah, without ever realizing it, Judah is foreshadowing his greater son, Jesus Christ, who one day would come and offer himself in place of us all. And Jesus does it through his own brokenness. This is what the scripture says in Hebrews. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation for all who obey Him. See, the cross is where Jesus stepped forward and offered Himself in our place. It's where the burden we couldn't bear was borne by Him. Where sun and frost and judgment and mercy intersect. And where reconciliation finally takes place. The Bible says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. At the cross, an exchange takes place. Blessed Jesus bears our brokenness, and through His brokenness, we are blessed. You know, a church I served up in Ohio went through some pretty rough times before I got there. They had experienced a, a very traumatic split in the late 90s. It was all very complicated, and actually, from everything I was told, the fault lines for the split began appearing many years before, even back into the 80s, and it was over a variety of issues. Uh, some folks wanted to worship one way, others had different ideas, some wanted to leave the denomination, others wanted to stay. I, I wasn't there when it happened, so I can't speak from personal experience. All I know was that when the church finally split, it was just a former shell of itself. More than one-third of the members left, and most of those were families with young children. You saw all the beautiful young kids up there. Imagine coming to church, there were no children. In fact, the first Sunday after their split, there were only 12 people in the early service. Now, we came two and a half years later. Things had gotten a little better, but there was only one baby in the entire church. Our four nearly quadrupled the number of youth. The church was definitely on life support. A neighboring minister told me they didn't think the church would make it, but it did. By God's grace, it began to thrive again. It, it was never as big as this church. It didn't have the resources we have to enjoy, but they knew they had the Lord and that was enough. And looking back on everything, all the things that almost put them under, one of my closest friends from that church, still one of my closest friends today, a man who will actually be listening and seeing this sermon on, on the internet, his name is Ed. Ed, you know who you are. But Ed shared with me something profound. He shared with me something I have never forgotten. Looking at all those painful times the church endured, Ed said, 
He said, I would never want to go through anything like that again. I would never want to go through anything like that again. But at the same time, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it made us who we are today. Do you understand what Ed meant by that? Are there situations you'd never want to go through again, but at the same time have made you the person you are today? Brokenness that God turned into a blessing? Maybe you're in the midst of it right now. You don't see any way out or how things can possibly turn out for your good or your blessing. We've all been there. I promise you, some of us are there right now, I know. But the cross of Jesus Christ is God's ultimate example of bringing blessing out of brokenness, redeeming the irredeemable, and making something great. I'm not promising it'll be easy, or that it'll even be easy to understand. Just know, just know that at the end of it all, when Joseph threw his arms around his brothers and kissed them and he wept, that love had finally won out. Love had won out over everything else. And God promises with absolute certainty that his love for you and me will certainly win out in the end too. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, we thank you for your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you bore our brokenness, Lord, and turned it into blessing. And Lord, the cross is all we have to focus on to remember, Lord, that when we walk through life, when we travel through things, Lord, that seem very hard to bear and we don't understand, Lord, we look at how you reverse things, how you push Joseph and his brothers to bring them, Lord, to be the men you wanted them to be, to bring blessing to the whole world to be the line, Lord, the lineage of your Son. And Lord, help us to remember that, Lord, that you are always in control. You hold heaven and earth in your hands. You hold our lives, our past, our presents, and futures, all in your great mercy and love, Lord. And as your word tells us, nothing shall ever separate us from the love of God. It is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Lord, let us see through this journey with Joseph, Lord, how you work in our lives. Lord, bless especially this church, Lord, that we may be a vehicle of your redemption, Lord, sharing the the love of Christ. Lord, we pray for those in the church who are struggling with illness now, serious illness, Lord. Those dealing with cancer, Lord, or, or heart issues, those hospitalized now, Lord, in nursing homes. Lord, those right now who are quietly bearing burdens, Lord, that only you know. Lord, those who need your healing touch, by your Spirit, Lord, minister to those deepest places in our lives. Bring us renewal, Lord, and help us to be your vehicles of redemption and blessing to others. And we give thanks now, Lord, lifting our voices, praying as one people the way Christ our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite